All right, welcome to another episode, Tom Kennedy Science. Now, our topic today is going to be atomic structure or the structure of atoms. And this is for my Bio for Health Related Science class. It's a freshman biology course for non majors. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but this is going to be a brief overview. So I'm going to introduce the subatomic particles, atomic structure, of course, like the nucleus and electron shells. And then I will discuss briefly isotopes, including radioisotopes, their half-lives, and why we can use those. I mean, I did my PhD using a lot of isotopes, so I have a, a soft spot for using isotopes in science. Okay, so atoms, you know, they're comprised of basically three subatomic particles. And for the most part, they were created during the Big Bang, but you can also get these, some of them, neutrons, they're in nuclear fusion inside the stars as well. Well, the subatomic particles that we care about most as biologists in terms of atomic structure are the protons, neutrons, and electrons. And on the right, you see the simplified diagram of a carbon atom. And you can see that the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus. And you can see that the electrons are outside of the nucleus. Yes, that's not exactly how it looks. For those of you that are more interested in higher level chemistry, um, I'll do another lecture on orbitals and wave functions and things like that and probabilities of where you'll find the electrons. But for our purposes right now, this model works okay. So we've got these atoms. You know, they're mostly empty space. I mean, I should show a picture of this, but you know, if you had a stadium and you put the nucleus, they would, the nucleus would be the protons and neutrons would be on basically the 50 yard line and they'd be the size of ping pong balls. And the electrons would be fleas orbiting outside of the stadium, it's pretty crazy. But in our atomic structure, got the nucleus, the center of it, atoms are mostly space. We got the protons and the neutrons. So the atomic number is the number of protons and protons are positively charged. Now you'll also see something like carbon and you'll see carbon 12, okay? That's the atomic mass. So the mass is the number of protons plus the neutrons. So going to our examples here, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, those are four of the most abundant elements used by life. Hydrogen is atomic number one, one proton. It also has a mass of mostly one, so it's got no neutrons. However, there are variations of hydrogen that does have neutrons in it. Okay, those are called isotopes, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, carbon. Carbon is element number six, which means it has six protons in the nucleus. Now, most carbon atoms, an atomic mass of 12, which means they have six protons and six neutrons. Now, if you ever notice on the periodic chart, there'll be like 12.01. Once again, that's because there are variations on this carbon where there's more neutrons. Nitrogen is element number seven. You already got this. The atomic number, that's right, seven. The atomic mass, 14, which means it also has seven neutrons in there in the nucleus with the protons that help stabilize that nucleus, all right? Because you gotta have the right uh, combinations of protons and neutrons to be, to be uh, stable and oxygen, eight protons, and it has, most of them have eight neutrons as well. And they also, I was getting ahead of myself a little bit, but they also have eight electrons because the number of these positively charged protons also equals the number of electrons. Now, electrons are about a thousand times less massive than the protons or the neutrons because protons and neutrons weigh about the same, they're about the same mass. But these electrons are generally found in what's called electron shells that are found outside the nucleus. So once again, you can see our, our atoms here, the hydrogen, the carbon, the nitrogen, and the oxygen. And you'll notice that there's one shell and that first shell holds two electrons. And then the second shell holds up to eight electrons. Now, when the shells are full, that element is chemically stable, and that's important, right? So if you don't have a full shell, then you will either acquire electrons or share electrons to become chemical stable, 
And that is, um, that's the basis of how we get bonding, which creates molecules, okay? So these chemical bonds complete these electron shells so they'll be stable. All right, so now we've got these elements. I've already mentioned them. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. All in all, there's about 92 naturally occurring elements all the way up to uranium 92. And its atomic mass is, well, on average is 238 is a very common one. So that tells you there are a lot more neutrons in uranium than there are protons. Now, an element, these are atoms, but they are the smallest unit of matter that maintains its chemical properties. So oxygen has different chemical properties than carbon. And a lot of it has to do with um, the, the electrons orbiting, the or not orbiting, but the electrons outside of the nucleus. And an element like carbon or oxygen or gold for that matter, you cannot alter these elements at all by doing chemical reactions. There is no chemical reaction that can alter carbon. Only nuclear reactions can do that, okay? Now, if you've noticed, I said, hey, there's these different varieties of an element. Carbon, let's say carbon 12, atomic number is six, atomic mass is 12, carbon 12, six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Okay, well, you can take any element and vary the number of neutrons. That creates what is called an isotope, all right? Now, they're going to have the same chemical properties. So you're going to have still six protons. You're going to have six valence electrons. Those are the electrons in the outer shell. So you have four valence electrons in the outer shell of a carbon atom. And that means that you can form with the four covalent bonds. Now, I can have seven neutrons or eight neutrons in my nucleus, and I'm changing my atomic mass, but not the atomic number, okay? So they, they, they are heavier than each other, but the number of bonds they're gonna form is going to be the same. So these are the three common isotopes of carbon. Actually, uh, carbon-13 is not that common. It's like one out of a thousand is carbon-13. Carbon-14 is even more rare. And you've probably have heard that some of these um, isotopes are unstable, like carbon-14. Sometimes you can have uh, too many or too few neutrons, but if you have the right amount of neutrons, like you know, in carbon-12 and carbon-13, these elements are incredibly stable. Like, we don't even know how long they could last maybe 10 million billion years longer than the age of the universe. I mean, there's some some ideas that like these things could be lasting a trillion, trillion, trillion years, or at least that's how long a, 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 a proton can last. But some of these stable isotopes are just incredibly stable. I mean, 10 million billion times longer than the age of the universe, right? So carbon 12, the carbon in your body, the carbon 12 and 13, those carbon atoms are over 5 billion years old. Some of them might even be as old as 10 or 11 billion years old, formed from the very first stars in the universe. Now, these radioisotopes. If you have too many neutrons or too few neutrons, then you have what is called a radioisotope because they emit particles. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture here, but alpha and beta, for those of you that are interested, now, these radioisotopes are going to decay into daughter isotopes that are more stable. So for example, carbon-14 will kick out an electron and then a neutron, I don't know how this happens, turns into a proton and you go from carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. And it does this at a very specific rate called the half-life. And every radioisotope has a very specific half-life. And that is the amount of time it takes half of your amount of that isotope to decay. So the most you know, popular or well-known radioisotope is carbon-14. And it takes about 5,730 years for half of it to decay. So if I had a gram, come back in 5,730 years, I'll have half a gram. Come back in another 5,700 years, I'll have a quarter of a gram. Do that again. 
another 5,730 years, I'll have one eighth of a gram. You get the idea. Now, other isotopes have much longer half-lives. Some can have a half-life like uranium. Some of the variations of uranium could be over 4 billion years old. So believe it or not, we don't actually use carbon-14 to date old rocks. That's We only use it to date things that have died in the last 50 or so thousand years. But we use lots of other radioisotopes to date rocks going back to the age of the Earth, the origin of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago. All right. Isotopes. Oh my gosh, you can use them for so many purposes. I've already mentioned one. If you come across an old archaeological site or you want to get the age of a really ancient tree, you can use carbon-14 dating. Okay, if you want to know the age of a dinosaur bone, there's no way to use carbon-14. It's, it's all gone, but you could use other elements. And if you want to understand the age of a rock or rocks or how old the earth is, then you might use radioisotopes that last millions to billions of years uh, on their half-life. Okay, we can also use radioisotopes in medicine and physiology. One way that's important is we can figure out things like your metabolic cycles, like the Krebs cycle, glycolysis. We can track the carbons because we can, we can label certain carbons with isotopes and then track them through the chemical reactions and start to understand chemical reactions um, that way. We can also track what happens to our food as it goes through us. Uh, so medicine, physiology, biochemistry relies a lot on using isotopes. We can use it in ecology. You can figure out like, where's your carbon coming from, right? Uh, is it coming from aquatic sources? Is it coming from terrestrial sources? We can use it, of course, in geology for understanding uh, age and structure of our different strata. We can use it, we can use stable isotopes in climate change. Oh yeah, you can look at like the ratios of heavy oxygen, O18, right? Uh, to the lighter ones, O16. So, uh, um, And then we can figure out like what the average temperature was and reconstruct climate when we look at ice core data and other things. So uh, yeah, these isotopes are really, really, really important. Use them in paleontology too to reconstruct, you know, nu uh, nutrient flows like nitrogen and and carbon, we can understand like where sulfur is coming from, and we can even use it in environmental science to track various different types of uh, of toxins in the environment. So, the many uses of isotopes, both stable isotopes and radioisotopes, there's an entire field that's just absolutely dedicated to all these things that you can use. Okay, well, I hope you learned something. So, until next time, stay curious. This is Tom Kennedy Science.